Hello, hello everyone. Um, um, so my usual first question, can you see and hear me? If you can just use the chat, can you see Professor Goldwasser? Let's just wait to see that people can see us. Hi. So can someone, can you, I'm, I'm just going to type, can you, do you see us? Okay, yes. Okay, so um, it, it's very, very exciting and fun to be back at another Stark at Home episode. For those who haven't attended yet, uh, this is a place where we discuss things related to proofs, cryptographic proofs, sometimes zero knowledge, as will be this, uh, this one. And we generally talk about things that are involving rather deep mathematical concepts, but uh, we take a very, you know, more layperson and leisurely pace and, you know, without too many proofs, definitions and so on. So for this episode, uh, it is a, a very great honor to have no other than the co-inventor of zero knowledge and interactive proofs, Professor Shafi Goldwasser who is uh, of MIT, uh, the Berkeley Simons uh, Institute for Theoretical Computer Science and uh, Weizmann University, uh, 2012 Turing uh, Award winner. I'll stop here because, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, there are Gettle Prizes, I believe two of them, and so on and so forth. But if we go on, we'll take the whole hour. So uh, the most important thing for folks who are intending this is, uh, you know, ZKPs are all the rave. Everyone's using them and doing them. So, and we have this opportunity to hear how it all started. Uh, so we'll have this chat. I just ask that uh, questions, please use the ask a question. And please, I saw there's one question there that is, uh, I don't know in which language exactly, but it's not something. So please try to use Google Translate uh, to make it in English, but I'll just, uh, um, I'll show you an example. Here is, hi, here's a question. So please use that screen. And once in a while, we're gonna pause and um, have questions. So without further ado, um, uh, I'll, I'll, if it's, is it okay if I refer to you as Shafi or uh, should I use? No, no, definitely refer to me as Shafi. It would be really too, <laughs> too awkward if you refer to me as Professor Goldwasser. Okay. Can you take us back to like the atmosphere, the environment, like before the invention, like what were you doing? Where were you? And like, what was it like? What was going around those days? Sure. So um, I was a graduate student at Berkeley, which is where I'm at also now. I uh, spent most of my career at MIT, but I came back to Berkeley a few years ago. Anyway, I was a graduate student at Berkeley. This is the early 80s. And... Um, you know, there's uh, these wonderful theory professors there, Descartes, Manuel of Love. And uh, I was at the stage where I was taking classes. And one of the courses that was uh, being offered was by the, uh, Professor Manuel Blum, who became my thesis advisor. And this was about number theory uh, from a computational point of view. So questions like, how do you know if a number is a prime? Uh, how do you factor uh, integers? Uh, how do you solve discrete logs? So these are mathematical terms. I know this is supposed to be for also for lay audience. Some questions that involve numbers. And uh, at the end of the course, the last two lectures, uh, he says that this number theory, these questions like uh, whether numbers are prime, whether you can factor integers, the prime products like 15 into three times five and so forth, but for larger numbers, it's a much more of a challenge. Um, but this has been uh, used recently to do what's called the public key cryptography. Public key cryptography, meaning that there are two, you know, people who can communicate secretly over uh, the internet without never ever meeting. And um, do you hear the birds chirping? They're in the yard here. That I cannot turn off. But in any case, um, no. Uh, okay. So there's this public key cryptography. At this point, there's three papers. There is a uh, paper that invented the concept by uh, two people from uh, Diffie and Hellman. Hellman is at Stanford. Diffie, I think, was a grad student at Berkeley at some point. And then uh, there was a paper by Rivest Shamir and Adelman. Uh, Shamir is in uh, Weizmann Institute now, but at the time, all three of them were at MIT, where they give a first example of something that might be a secure public ecosystem. Namely, that people could communicate privately over the internet without ever meeting in advance. 
And there's another paper, I think, by Adi Shamir uh, breaking some previous scheme. Uh, it was based on some other problem, which was not from number theory. So that's it. There are three papers. And uh, he says to us, this is all using the assumption that there's some problems in number theory which are really hard to break. And we're going to build these crypto systems which are secure if, in fact, these problems are hard to solve, like factoring integers. And that's it. Uh, but he mentions one other question, and he says, um, I think he mentioned it in this class. Not completely sure. I think so, yeah. He says, uh, suppose you have two people, and we'll call them Alice and Bob, and uh, they want to do something else besides just communicate secretly. They want to play uh, a game over the internet. Uh, and he called it mental poker. So there was one more paper, which was called How to Play uh, Mental Poker. This was again by Shamir Reves and Alman, I think different order of names. Uh, but in any case, they proposed a protocol where two people without a physical deck of cards can play a game over the internet. A fair, like you play with a deck of cards, where you can put the cards down, and you can take a random card from the deck, and so forth. And uh, the thing is, he says, and then some other guy called Lipton, who's another professor in our field, found that there is actually a problem with this protocol. Not that anybody was using it, but it's all in theory and papers. And the problem was that you could find some partial information. So in other words, it could possibly be that even though you you cannot tell what card uh, you are choosing from the deck, you could tell some partial information. About it. Now, in the game of poker, that's very important, right? You can tell if a card is high or low, whatever. So there is an open problem. How do you play mental poker? Hiding all partial information about the cards. So after that, I mean, there are other things that people were working on, uh, but not in cryptography, obviously. I mean, this is this is it. As far as I know, this is it. And then we were um, grad students, both me and Silvio uh, Michali, who got the Turing Award with me. Sorry. For could, the I, could I just pause and ask, um, so I, I guess most of the listeners and I are familiar with poker. What do you mean by, by, by mental poker? Okay, uh, by mental poker. Right? Okay, by mental poker, I mean... Um, there's a slide that where this problem was defined, I can maybe share the screen. Not so important, I can just describe it. Mental poker, I mean, is that there's no deck of cards and we're not in the same room. You're in Tel Aviv or wherever you are now, I don't know, that's Elia, Natanya, and I am in Berkeley. And we want to play poker and I don't trust you, obviously, because I want to win and you don't trust me because you want to win. So we are adversarial to each other. And yet we want to play this game and we want to be able to determine that every move was performed properly and that you follow the rules and that uh, you, and that there's some way to deal cards. And there's no third party, there's no physical medium. We're just going to send messages back and forth to each other, but somehow we want to emulate the rules of poker and to determine who won and who lost. That's mental poker. It's like we play it sort of in our minds in some sense, but there is a computer and we can exchange yes, messages. Okay, so how does this have to do with the zero knowledge? You have to have patience. All my stories are very long, <laughs> but they do have a point. <laughs> and just in case... Uh, I don't forget the point. It's actually a good point. But in any case, the point is this. So Sylvia and I go and we and we um, and we come up with a protocol, a completely different protocol uh, to play mental poker. And the protocol, you know, there's a lot of things there. It has nothing to do with zero knowledge. But you'll see in a second that it it actually was the inspiration for it, because first what we do is we come up with an encoding of the cards. Okay, and before that, they were sort of encrypting the cards with an RSA scheme. What we were doing is we were saying, let's think of a name of a card as a binary string, zeros and ones, and each, uh, uh, and we'll encode the name of the card sort of bit by bit. So, in the way that, so we want to encode zeros and ones rather than, you know, big numbers, uh, which is not clear how to do with RSA uh, off the bat. And the idea was that we will take some hard problem in number theory, which is sort of a zero one problem. This is what we call in computer science decision problems, like saying, is a number prime or composite? Or is there, if I give you a quadratic equation or some kind of equation, is there a solution or not? That's a zero one question. And we're gonna take a problem which is hard to solve. In fact, it was a problem where there's an equation and uh, is there a solution or not? And uh, if we wanna encode a zero, we put an instance of the problem where there's no solution to the equation. And if the, we wanted to encode a, a binary bit one, then we put an instance of the problem where there is a solution. And we said, this is how we encode a card. It's a bunch of equations, one per bit, the name of the card. Some have solutions, some don't, and that corresponds to whether you're encoding a zero or one. Okay, so there was a way to encode cards, and then we needed a way to deal cards, and there's this fabulous idea that's due to Michael Rabin, 
at that time, it, it was like for three months before that he came up with this, when he was visiting Berkeley, which is called oblivious transfer. The idea here is how do I send you someone information, okay? I give someone actually information, but I don't know whether I gave it to them or not. Some weird thing. It's like either I, you get garbage or you actually give, I give you the information, but I have no idea. So obliviously I transfer to you information. It seems like a weird concept, incredibly useful for everything in cryptography today. But at the time, what we saw was that there was a way, if I encoded all the cards, I'm playing with Ellie. I encoded all the cards in this weird way that I said with the zeros and ones, but forget about that now. And Ellie, so there's 32 cards to begin with, 32, 52, whatever, 52. <laughs> You know, at that time, I've never held a deck of cards in my hands because I grew up in Israel. It was from a different joke. Is that right? I grew up in Israel and my mother came from Fulvitkin. And the whole idea of playing cards was totally tame. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like needed. But in any case, so 52 cards. So um, that was just for the Hebrew speakers in the audience, assuming that there are such. But in any case, so, the, so I've encoded the, I encoded all the cards and Ellie now wants to choose a card. He doesn't know I, have, I scrambled it. Uh, but so he decides he wants card three, but he doesn't know what card three is. And he makes, and then we do this oblivious transfer thing where I know that I'm transferring to him one card, but I don't know which. So it's okay. So I transfer him a card. That means that now he can read it. Transfer means that now he can read it. I gave him the key that opens this card. Okay. And then when I want to choose my cards, um, which card I take, um, again, we do something similar, but that's the point, okay? So, wonderful, there's a poker game. And how do we check though, that we follow the rules, that really I encoded the cards properly, that all the steps were done properly, okay? For that, we had a different idea. The idea was that at the end of the game, when the game is done, we all have to open everything. I have to open all the encodings of how I really encrypted the cards, and you have to open all the steps you did, and we check that throughout the game, we follow the rules, okay? So the game is done. It's already been determined who's the winner or loser. There was no partial information, everything is kosher, but we have to check post-game that things were done properly. So then we thought to ourselves, but this is not really like poker. Apparently there's strategy involved, and I don't want to necessarily for you to know what my strategy was, but if we reveal everything afterwards, the keys and all that, then that you know my strategy. And if we think about poker as a repeated game, this doesn't really satisfy it. So we thought of this idea, how can I prove to you that I did everything in the way I was supposed to do without revealing any information? But now it starts to sound like zero knowledge. If you see my drift. Can, can we can we pause for a moment before we get to, I agree that at least to me, it sounds a bit like zero knowledge, but before that, I want to pause and, and ask you like, a bit more about like, I mean, you're two grad students, you hear a lot of, uh, um, you know, lectures and a lot of open problems. And I mean, did you work on all of them on some, like, what was it about? Like, how did you, because I mean, you ended up with something amazing that we're all building on and so on. Like, did you, yeah. What rule of thumb did you use when you went to this particular problem, which sounds to me just like, one random problem from a million others that people hear all about so, so all the time. So yeah, what was, how did it come about? Okay, so first of all, I think that the rule of thumb for me, and it's not a rule of thumb for everyone, but it's suitable for me, is sort of that I like it. So it's in some sense an intuition that this appeals to me. Number theory appealed to me, this idea that you can transmit something without knowing that you've transmitted it, and the fact that you can sort of encode a zero one, this sort of intellectually intriguing. Turned out that in fact, this is the basis for a lot of inventions later, because we talked about encoding zero one because we wanted to hide partial information. And there was no way to speak about partial information theoretically, rather if you didn't define it. And to define it, you need to talk about every single bit of information. So a single bit could be just a bit of, of the name of the card. So it had to be hidden. Okay, but it turns out that actually encrypting this way in a binary fashion, zero and one, means that we can do things like homomorphic encryption, we can sort of represent computations, circuits, and binary circuits, and so forth. But back to your question. Um, you said there are so many questions. Why did you choose this one? First of all, there, it is intuition. Second of all, there are not that many questions. So it was the beginning of the field. There were three papers. Uh, there was this mental poker paper. And... Uh, 
I think we were very lucky that way as graduate students. There wasn't a million things to work on. But even today, even though there's a lot of papers, too many in my opinion, in all fields, um, but you know, people want to write papers because they're graduate students and they have to get degrees and people have to get promoted. And uh, there's a big wide world out there. But even though there are a lot of papers and a lot of problems, not all of them are of the same intrinsic importance. And here I want to say that even though we're talking within Stark, uh, where so we are talking within a company and we, it's very important to us that we can use these things in practice. The notion of intrinsic importance it transcends application. So intrinsic importance, I mean, um, there's something about the problem that fundamentally seems impossible or fundamentally seems interesting to solve. And that is something that, uh, you know. You know, it reminds me a little bit, and I, I still want to, there's this uh, joke uh, that says, um, how do you become rich? You buy um, a good stock at a low price, you wait for it to go up and then it, you sell it. And then the other person should ask, okay, but what if it doesn't go up? So the answer is no. Oh, so don't buy it. So like by analogy, you know, how do you get, let's say the Turing award, you find a really, really hard, nearly impossible question, a very interesting one to solve. You work very hard and you solve it. Oh, if you don't solve it, oh, you, you know, you choose a different oh, problem. Right. But, but having said that, we did not know that this was going to be about such an important problem. And we didn't even know that it was going to be so difficult. But it was definitely interesting. And it was definitely kind of, and I don't even know if we thought in terms of fundamental or not fundamental. It was challenging. And I got to say that, you know, I think that in the olden days, people worked on their own also. You know, you think of the mathematician sitting in their office alone working, suffering. So there's definitely a lot of suffering, even if you're not alone, but it's less suffering. So also part of working on this problem was a collaborative effort. You know, you come up with ideas and you and definitions and trying to satisfy them and showing there's a bug. There's a lot of struggle and kind of uh, um, back and forth involved. And I think that's very conducive to better ideas. So another question before we go back to the story of, you know, the zero knowledge proof. First of all, I just want to make a very small clarification because on the chat and so on. Um, I, I don't like uh, a lot of people signed up and we had some suspicion in Starker that some people are you know, speculating or anticipated that this in any way entails anything like an airdrop or whatever. And I see a lot of people writing, you know, good morning and hi. And so, guys, I don't know how to break it to you, but um, this is not related to uh, any any sort of token whatsoever. Uh, the only token you do get are tokens of knowledge from uh, Professor Shafi Goldwasser and so on. So uh, please reserve the chat to, uh, you know, just discussing the content. And if you have questions, ask them. But those of you who showed up because they think there'll be some, um, you know, token reward, this or that. I'm sorry to break with you. This is not the place. Um, That's it? Everybody's dropping off? No, <laughs> no, no, I think, I hope that. Well, it, people who came for that, uh, they are welcome to stick around and learn. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, there's no token in the end of this thing. Uh, just knowledge, uh, even though it's about zero knowledge. Okay, so, um, so, so by the oh, one more question before we go back to proofs. Um, so, so you felt back in the day that this is a really nice fundamental question. Do you remember throughout your, you know, illustrious career, other places and, and even more recently where you were sitting and saying, wow, this is like, this is a good question. And maybe, yeah. I mean, a lot of our listeners are probably in the academic path. So yeah, if you can share, like, what are the, you know, what jumps to mind? Definitely. So, for example, I think another one that comes to my mind, and I didn't prepare this, you didn't ask me this, you didn't say you were going to ask this, so, so um, but the thing that just jumps to my mind is that when uh, I came to sabbatical, actually, in 86, to Hebrew University from MIT, and um, and people asked me, I think it was Miki Benu and Avi eh, and Noam, uh, Nisan, they said, well, so is there any, anything else left to solve in cryptography? We're talking 1986, 1987. And um, and I was like, you know, pressed to answer. And 
the, and the answer was, at that time, was how do we remove assumptions? With a lot of assumptions. Everything was under assumptions. Doing zero knowledge universally was under assumptions, except for special cases. Um, and, and then, and then uh, the, my first thing was, well, what about changing the model? Instead of having zero knowledge, where you have somebody proving, in a minute we'll talk about zero knowledge, but there's two parties. There's a prover and a verifier. And, a, uh, and, and there's an assumption that it's zero knowledge, uh, you know, if factoring is hard or some other hard problem. And uh, can we remove that assumption? And that produced a new model where you don't have a single prover, but two provers, well, we can talk about it later. Uh, so that was one, another point. Uh, and that wasn't, so the question here wasn't a mathematical question, how do you uh, play mental poker? But it was like, well, everything's under the assumptions. There's no more, nothing to do. And I say, no, no, wait a second. We can improve the result. We can maybe remove assumptions by changing the model. That's another example. You know, another example is that I, I saw a talk about elliptic curves. Uh, people here in the audience might know about elliptic curves because of their cryptographic connections. And it was a talk by Victor Shoup. I think this is around 87. And he showed how, um, I think the talk was how to um, uh, come up with uh, generators or something uh, with proof. Uh, for elliptic curve, curve group, and it sort of occurred to me at the time that the mathematics that he was using can be seems to work always when we're holding in your hand is a prime. But what if he didn't have a prime, and uh, that everything would work differently? And that in itself could be a way to distinguish between primes and composites. And that turned actually to this elliptic curve based primality testing. So there's another way to come up with problems, and as you're sitting in a talk and somebody shows you a technique, and you think to yourself, how would it work if you change the inputs? You know. Uh, would, and then it might distinguish something about the inputs. So there are many, many ways to come up with an idea that turns out to be influential. It's not a clear formula, you know. Does that answer your question more or less? Yeah, I think, I mean, um, uh, for sure, a large part of uh, ingenuity in, in math and science is things like picking the right question or even just formulating the right model or making the right definition. I mean, people give a lot of respect to like theorems and hard proofs, but so much of the progress often is about right defining the right model. And of course, you know, you, you've done <laughs> spectacularly well on that front. So um, yeah, it's still, uh, I mean, there's, yeah, we don't get from this a method of how to pick the next question to, to think What's about it. It's uh, still very inspiring. Okay, so back to you, you You had some solution for the mental poker, but you were unsatisfied with the fact that it was revealing information. So um, what next? Okay, so here we are. We have this mental poker, but you have to reveal everything at the end and we don't want to reveal anything. How do we now uh, not reveal everything and still prove to the other party that we follow the rules, okay? And in particular, for the mental poker protocol, if you go back to what I just discussed about how you encode zeros and ones, okay, there was essentially, I want to prove to you that I've encoded zeros and ones on, on the cards, right? And, um, and, not, uh, and more, you know, that I've encoded the right name, right zeros, uh, 52 cards have names and it's the right names and so forth. But just let's get distilled to one issue. And that is that I've encoded a zero. Okay, so I need to prove you to you that I've encoded a zero or, I'm, or I've encoded either a zero or a one and nothing else. And what it translated to was, is when I told you how to encode zeros was I was gonna give you an equation. Uh, the equation was, uh, it was a number uh, and I wanted to prove to you that this number there's a, uh, is, a, is a square. What does that mean? It's like 25 is five squared, but there's some, a little bit more complicated version of that where um, 25 is five squared mod n, when it's some, it's some operation. And that's a hard problem, it turns out, unless you know how to factor n. And I wanna to prove to you that in fact, this 25 has is looks like a five squared or a number in general, y looks like x squared. But I don't wanna give you x. I just wanna show you that there is a, in, such an x exists, okay? So the first zero knowledge proof was a proof of that there exists a solution to this particular equation. Okay, in such a way that at the end you are with probability, you know, one minus one in Avogadro's number, you know, exponentially small probability of an error. So there was an error. I might convince you and it's wrong, but very, very, very unlikely 
that this is an encoding of a zero without actually having you be able now, so this is the intuition of zero knowledge coming, be able to prove it to anybody else or learning anything else except the fact that this number or this equation has a solution. And similarly about one, okay? So, yeah, so I, I just want to pause here because this is like, like the moment of invention. And I just want to understand because everything about our intuition of proofs is that they are giving you information and you have this protocol. And indeed, as it should, when you open up the cards, you see this was a zero, this was a one, and that's how you, and all the proofs we saw till that moment, um, I mean, the, you that, ever, that the world knew of is about information and that's how you prove it. How, like, where did you have the sort of audacity, right? Or audacity to like think that this can be even done, right? Like, it's like time travel or something. Where, how did that come about? Like, why would, why would you even imagine that it's possible and not completely impossible to prove something without giving information about it? So your question has a lot of parts. One is, uh, when you talk about a proof, and in fact, early on when we would uh, go around and give talks and mathematicians would be in the audience, it really annoyed them, I think, that we use the word proof. Because, uh, and also zero knowledge proof, what's the point? Uh, okay, so now, by now, we think it's a wonderful thing, but to begin with, in fact, proofs are supposed to convey information. But so, but the point is that when you think about it cryptographically, right, there are two things. One is you want to say that the statement is, you want to, you want to, be, when I prove to you something, now you believe that the statement that I proved is correct. That's one. And two, now you also have a, the, a proof, you know, in the mathematical sense, you know, that uh, mathematical, I mean, traditional mathematical, where, you know, Pythagoras theorem, there's like a, a proof of Pythagoras theorem or, and so forth. Um, so now you can learn from it, you can pass it to other people and so forth. So there's this question of separating. And in cryptography, it's clear, at least in this example of the Manta Poker, is that you need to know that it's correct, but nothing else is of value. Okay, so, so uh, the audacity though, you know, we didn't think about it as a proof, we thought about it as a protocol. So we thought of it as a way to play the game that at the end, in fact, you will learn nothing and the game has been played properly. We had partial information, we followed the rules and so forth. The reason we called it a proof, I think this is really due to uh, Mike Sipser. So we described to him this proof of how something is a, uh, this equation is solvable, equations are not solvable. He said, and, and we said that, we explained to him, you know, that with very small probability, you will accept it if it's, you will always accept it if the proof is correct. You will extremely unlikely, uh, you always reject it, except for very exceptional cases if the proof is wrong. And he said, wow, he says, this is like a, like a probabilistic proof. I think he said that. And he was like, wow, I think we acknowledged that in the first paper. So we, we said, okay, we're gonna call, call this interactive proof. And uh, because then, and then you distill the fact of what is a proof anyway? A proof is such that I cannot, I can prove correct things and I can prove, and I cannot prove incorrect things. And we call this in the definition of interactive proofs, completeness requirement, which is everything that's true can be proved and soundness, which means that if it's not true, you cannot be proved, but we make a modification. And that is the soundness we say with high probability. So mathematical proofs, they're supposed to be correct, QED, you know, there's no notion of maybe there's a probability that's incorrect. Although in truth, if you look at the history of mathematics, lots of proofs are incorrect. You know, in fact, I, I would venture to say that most proofs are incorrect, but the theorems are usually correct. But never mind, that's a different uh, thing. But so what we quantify, we say soundness. You know, it's the, we allow a very, very, very exponentially small probability of error. Because the point being is if it's so small that in the lifetime of the universe, so it's one over lifetime, uh, you ne you, you, you're never going to encounter it, then we don't care. So it's all with respect to computational in some sense setting. We're saying the probability is so small that it's not going to take place. Okay, so back to proofs. So we... The, a few things changed this from uh, uh, this kind of proofs that we're talking about from regular mathematical proofs that people learn geometry when they take you know high school geometry, which I think is the only place that they really learn proof in high school. And that is one is that there is an explicit understanding that there's a prover and a verifier. 
So when you write down a proof, you sort of you, you're proving it. Then who knows who's reading it? But here we're saying no. There are entities. There's the prover entity, which is let's say me, and there's the verifier entity, the one who's reading the proof, which is L. That's one. Two, um, the prover and the verifier. It's not that I just write it and you read it, but we can interact. We can go back and forth. This is actually an interesting thing that has been removed over the years. But to begin with, I you ask me a question. I give you an answer, then you ask me another question, I give you an answer, we can go back and forth. Not too long, but we go back and forth. And at the end, you say, I accept, or you, you say, I reject your proof. And what we guarantee is that if, you, if I'm proving a correct theorem, you will accept. And if I'm claiming an incorrect thing, you will, with a very, very high probability, reject. Okay? And... Now where's zero knowledge? Okay, now you can add on top of it, but it's you know it's in addition. We would say we, we might want to say that at the end you've got nothing except the conviction that this is correct. How do we define that? So now you need to define that. So that's completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. And I don't know if we want to pause here, but we can talk about the definition of that layperson definition. Yes, very, very much. So first of all, I was thinking about your comment that a lot of mathematicians, you know, were very like uncomfortable with, uh, you know, calling this thing a proof and uh, feeling that. Uh, uh, so first of all, I can, you know, in, in my own career can also empathize with, you know, people like uh, very emotionally uh, accepting or not accepting all kinds of terms and, and definitions. Um, but I, I like maybe it is because I mean, you, okay, to mathematicians, there's like this association between understanding and seeing a proof. Like, I mean, what do people teach in courses of math, right? Here's, I want to teach you a theory, whatever, number theory. So it will be definition, you know, lemma, theorem, and proof. And the proof is everything. And then, you know, it's like blasphemy to say that here's a proof that convinces you you know, perfectly or near perfectly, but like does the job of now you know it is correct and yet you gained nothing from it. Um, so like... That's not true that you gain nothing from it. You gain the fact that it's correct. So if you think about, let's think about applications, forget about the rental poker. So let's think about passwords, right? Which was the first application, I think, that Adi Shamil and Amos Viot, you know, like uh, three months afterwards uh, that we published a paper found out. And which is, I... From now on, my ID, your ID, no, my ID, my ID is an equation, some number, which I claim that I know that, uh, that I, this is my number, okay, that's identifies Shafi. And when I log in, you know, if I can convince you that my number is a, is a, is a square, so it's like a 25, so there's this of five such that five squares equals 25, you know, in a, in a difficult, if 25 equals five square, we all know. Um, so I know the solution. I could, that's my password. Only the people who know the solution are Shafi. Okay. I could give you the solution, but then if somebody overhears me, or in particular you, will know now the solution, and you can identify yourself as me. So is there a way that I can prove to you that uh, I know the solution without giving it to you? Then there's a password method where even people over here over on the line, they have no idea um, how to pretend to be Shafi, and you yourself are convinced that I'm Shafi, but you have no idea how yourself to convince someone else that you are me. So, so are you understand? So, there's the, 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 but maybe it's blasphemy, but uh, but I wouldn't say that it has no use. I mean, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> Look, my 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 payroll is is uh, is uh, sort of uh, staked on uh, <laughs> zero knowledge and interactive proofs having having some use. So you know, I I'm convinced. Um, what what I meant was rather. I'm trying to now to sort of uh, represent, you know, a mathematician 30 years ago. Mathematicians have changed because also one is because time passes, people are younger and they, and they're born, they're already in some sense uh, into mathematics, they see this, that's one. But two also that the concept has improved over the years in the following sense, okay? And it's shown huge applications, not just to crypto, but actually to mathematics itself. So it paid back both to complexity theory, which is in, within, within computer science, theory of computer science, but also to classical mathematics. Because they somehow, through a whole bunch of evolution of things, uh, the current thing that people think about, um, for a second without zero knowledge, I'll say it, is something called a probabilistically checkable proof. 
the idea there is it actually is a proof that you write down. Okay, so I as a prover can write it down. Okay, we don't need the interaction, although interaction has benefits. But let's say I can write it down like classical proofs, but I keep it to myself. Okay, and what you, or I put it in a safe somewhere. And what you do, you're the verifier, is you're not allowed to read the whole thing, or you don't have time to read the whole thing. You are just going to poke it at random places. Okay. And what you would like is that even though you're poking it only in random places, okay, this is enough for you to be able to verify with extremely high probability in the way that we spoke before in terms of probability, that the, if you were to read the whole thing, it will be like a classical proof. So we, over the years, I was involved in some of it, uh, my, you were involved in some of it, many other people were. We know now how to take any classical proof, the kind of, like you learn in high school, and convert it. It's like a, an automatic conversion into a different kind of proof where people just have to look at random places and they are guaranteed that if there was a mistake anywhere in the original one, with very high probability they will find it even if they looked, poked in few places. Okay? So that's like a mathematical concept which is, you know, I, I must say, if I must say so myself, it's insane, it's, it's great. Uh, but it's also uh, allowed to solve problems in classical mathematics uh, which people didn't know how to solve before. So I want to ask something about, again, a, a bit about the process. So you have this uh, solution in your head and you started writing it up. Um, the core definitions of what is a proof, completeness and soundness, the interactive proof model, the notion of knowledge and how to define zero knowledge or lack of knowledge, um, were those like, was it like some Eureka and you saw it all? Was it a very iterative process? Was it uh, like, how, how did that unfold? So um, the first paper on mental poker just talks about encoding zeros and ones and uh, proving that this protocol is correct, okay? And then there was some sequence of, then, you know, we called it interactive proof. Uh, and there we had the completeness and soundness and definition and specific protocols for specific problems showing zero knowledge interactive proof. Zero knowledge, again, meaning intuitively that you uh, gain nothing, but there's actually a formal definition for it. And the formal definition just saying it not formally, but saying that after you were you the verifier, one is you're going to be convinced with very high probability, only if it's correct. And two, whatever you have learned, anything that you can output now after we've gone through this interaction, you could have actually learned even without our interaction. So in other words, it was of no use to you except the fact that you got convinced that this is correct. Okay, so that uh, so that's kind of a, a hint at a formal definition. But um, what was your question? <laughs> um, the question is, was, uh, did you immediately, or like how, the process of the core definition yeah, yeah, of emotion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so long, really, uh, because we were very intense. But that's, you know, we worked on this really hard. And at some point, so there was Sylvan uh, and me, and then Rakov joined in and helped us also crystallize things and, and improve the protocol. But the, what we went through is not what everybody else went through. We sent this to a conference. Maybe this is where your question is leading. We sent it to a conference. We were really happy. We were, um, but we were very worried because we were both going up for tenure, both Sylvia and I at MIT. Uh, but not just because of that, just because you want to get respect and admiration. <laughs> or, and, or you want people to know your work. Um, and then he got rejected. And uh, and then he got rejected again. I think he got rejected five, six times. Uh, I think usually we say four or five times because we're a little embarrassed. but. Uh, it got rejected a lot of times, at least four, probably five. And uh, we kept changing the name. We called it participatory proofs and and uh, many weird names till we got to the last name. A, I don't think really the concept of sound is completely sort of definition change. The protocols got better and better in the sense of they got to the point where there was no assumption whatsoever. It was zero knowledge based on no assumption uh, for these particular proving something equation satisfied or not. So 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 a question whether it was immediate? No, but not too far. It was mostly I gotta say that because it kept getting rejected, uh, luckily I was working with uh, Silvio, who's uh, I think the whole idea of conflict was really motivating for him. <laughs> and I mean I'm joking a little, but the, the idea of a fight was rather than discouraging, it was like, okay, 
So then we kind of got, worked on it more and more and improved it more and wrote the introduction better. And um, So I'll, I'll pause here to take, uh, there are a few questions. I'm not sure if, uh, okay, I'll, I'll go with the ones that I think you'll enjoy more answering. And some of them, I, I don't know if, uh, okay, we'll try to answer together or see what to do with it. So one question is the following by Miguel. Is it coincidental that Manuel Blum has had so many legends as his PhD student? And I want to add to that, like, you know, if I think about like the legendary, uh, you know, age of, physics like around you know the beginning of the 20th century so like one wonders was it the time that you know just all of these quantum mechanics questions so maybe like you know the 80s and 90s all of these questions were bubbling around or was it you know Manuel Blum or Descartes or someone else like what combination of those was it in your mind yeah it's a very good question I think that one is uh it's not accidental at all because I think Manuel, Manuel has had amazing intuition of what interests him. To begin with, it was a recursive function theory of what is computable, what's not computable. So these are, oh, oh, you know, when he did his PhD in, in MIT. And then it was um, inductive inference, which today is, you know, machine learning is all the rage. And then it was cryptography. And then after that, pro program checking. So he had really strong intuitions of what was interesting to him. Second of all, the way he uh, thinks is very, um, for a subset of people, very inspiring, very intuitive. And he is able to explain in a way that promotes inspiration. Yeah. And third, I think Berkeley as an environment at the time uh, was extremely good because there were a bunch of graduate students. They were from all over the world and they were a little bit uh, fearless. And, uh, you know, we weren't very critical of each other. Uh, we were competitive, but we weren't critical. So it was the environment at Berkeley. It was the fact that Manuel has tremendous good taste. And um, I think that's the answer. Okay. So uh, here's another question. I think, yeah, uh, okay. Um, so Shafiq is asking, was the term NP proof used back then? I'm not sure it was actually. I think we were uh, using it because we wanted to contrast interactive proofs with NP proofs. Okay. But the concept is there, obviously. You know, yeah. It's a witness. Yeah. Uh, another question that I'm not even sure if, uh, I don't know, maybe you know what this means, but if not, then we'll just, uh, okay. So Ali is asking, do you have any planning about LFG? So I don't know what I had asked him, what is LFG? Do you know, is LFG a term in cryptography? Maybe. What do you mean? I don't, I don't know. know. What, no, I asked uh, Ali. So Ali, if you want, you can uh, uh, comment there or explain what LFG is, but let's go on. Um, okay. Uh, another question by Varul. I feel one of the major hurdles in applications of ZKPs is that they are not trustless. Is it an impossibility or have trustless ZKPs not happened yet? So I think what you're talking about is going from interactive zero knowledge proofs to non-interactive zero knowledge proof. So uh, in the original rental poker, there was a back and forth. But when you think about applications to blockchain, especially in many other applications, you don't have the opportunity um, to uh, interact back and forth. Somebody wants to post the proof and somebody else is going to verify it. And there was an, an amazing paper by Silvio uh, Blum and Feldman um, in sometime in the late 80s, where they showed how they produced, produced another model. So in some sense, I went to the direction of talking about of working on complexity theory, so forgetting about the zero knowledge, you know, different models for proofs and uh, applications for hardness of approximation. And Silvio continued with the zero knowledge. And in his model, he removes interaction. So there is still a proven of verifier, but the verifier lives there implicitly. He's not really present. He can come after the fact. But and what, in order to make this go through, that it's zero knowledge, they had to trust that there was this something concept that they introduced, which was the common reference tree, which was this whole bunch of randomness in the sky in some sense, that everybody trusts that it's random. And the proof didn't control it, the verifier didn't control it. It's out there. And uh, under that assumption, 
the verifier can believe that this proof is in fact a proof, it's complete and sound, and also you can prove zero knowledge. So I think what you're referring is that you have to trust that string is random. Since then, people have thought about other models. It's not a random string, but it's sort of pre-processed string, but you trust that it was pre-processed correctly. Uh, so to answer your question, are there zero knowledge things without trust? Yeah, if you do the interaction, you don't need that. Yeah, so, so just to just to just to summarize in the end, yes, if you're willing to have interaction, then for some protocols there is you don't need any cryptographic assumptions. And uh, Shafi not only proved this for a very large class of initial pro uh, problems or was part of, of that effort, but also has a, a beautiful paper with uh, um, uh, Avi and Mickey, uh, uh, to, uh, oh, I thought you're talking about the two proof. I'm talking about the pro uh, GKR proofs for muggles also, like, uh, but, but yeah, both of them. Yeah, so maybe you want to say a few words about that and that. Yeah, so the thing with Avi and Mickey, which was in 87 when I came for the sabbatical, so Avi, they just want to make it know, was uh, really inspired by their questions. Okay, so now what? You know, there's nothing to do in crypto. And we said, okay, if we, instead of thinking about me proving something to, to Ellie, let, let, let's think that it's me and someone else, me and Silvio. Uh, we've committed, let's think about the fact that we have a proof and we want to convince Ellie that we have this proof of giving him no other knowledge. But we don't want to make any assumptions, okay? And we want to be able to convince any statement whatsoever, okay? And we don't know how to do this, actually, if, if there's only Shafi. But if there's Shafi and Silvio together, okay? And uh, even though Shafi and Silvio, let's say, are equivalent in this story, we know everything that the other person know. there's still an merit in having two of us. Why? What we're going to do is we're going to lock Silvio in another room. Let's say he's going to be in Rome, I'm going to be in Berkeley. And Ellie is going to believe that Silvio and I are not able to communicate to him. So he's going to ask me questions, he's going to ask Silvio questions. But we cannot know what he asked me and Silvio. Yeah, so he chooses these questions at random. And I answer. Silvio answered, and what Ellie does is change the consistency of our answers. So in the paper that we wrote with Avi and Mickey, we uh, we get, give the analogy, it's like there's a crime. Silvio and I have committed a crime. And the crime is that we are claiming that some theorem is true and it's not true. And uh, you put us, the police, Ellie is the police, he wants to verify our alibi. So he puts, he locks us in different rooms, asks us different questions, compares the answers. So we, uh, in this model, okay, where Sylvia and I cannot communicate where any, Ellie is asking us questions, you can show zero knowledge with no assumptions, with no trust, with no, not believing any problems are factoring anything, okay? It's a weird model, but people have actually in the quantum setting used that uh, to say that because of some quantum rules, blah, blah, this can actually be realized. And um, I guess that was one, and you asked me about the Muggles paper. So the Muggles work is different. This is work with uh, Yael Kalai and Guy Rothblum. Guy Rothblum is a professor in Weizmann, and, and Yael Kalai is a, also an adjunct professor at MIT, and uh, and uh, both my students, lucky for me. Hmm. I also have yeah. students. Um, you know. Manuel. But um, the, the idea there is that I can actually do computation in the cloud, say, uh, the cloud does a computation for me and it can prove to me that it's done it correctly. Even though the computation might have been extremely long, it can prove it to me and I can verify it extremely quickly. And that's also done in a way that uh, there's no assumptions, there's no trust, there's no nothing. But you can prove to me if you're the cloud, now we've changed places here, I'm the cloud, you're the verifier. Uh, you've put your data to me, the input, I did some incredibly long computation, now I proved to you that I did it correctly. And you can verify quickly. And this has been reduced actually to practice. So there are systems out there where people can actually implement this and they do implement it. So now, now I want to uh, get closer to the, um, you know, the current, uh, the current present. Uh, it's, it's nearly or, you know, close to 40 years since the, the invention of uh, interactive and zero knowledge proofs. And um, so you know, in these nearly four decades that have passed, like, first of all, did you see, like, did you see it's a big thing immediately or did you believe in others didn't see or are you surprised? And like, more generally, what about the trajectory of, um, of ZKP and interactive proof research has surprised you? And what things did you expect from the start? And, you know, oh, I always knew this would be like this. Okay, so this is, a, you're probably not going to predict my answer. But I, um, we thought it was a big deal. I, I, I'm surprised it took such a long time because 
it's so basic. Uh, and I think there's a lot more applications than the ones today. I mean, blockchain is nobody could have anticipated. It's like a, such a interesting, different technology. And the fact that zero knowledge is useful for proving that because you want to verify transactions and so forth and world economy. So that obviously we didn't. But I certainly thought that it was going to take catch on earlier uh, in the sense of that people would actually use it. And that's taken a while. But I still think that we're only scratching the surface. So I think, uh, for, I don't know, maybe that was going to be your next question. But I personally, I think there are a lot of legal questions that can be addressed using uh, zero knowledge. And I've been right, working on this recently. And so the interaction between zero knowledge and the law. So lots of things, you know, um, people, co companies negotiate. Uh, usually they sign NDAs, you know, because they don't trust each other, but they hope that if they reveal some information in a negotiation or in writing a contract with another company um, and the other company doesn't honor uh, secrecy of the negotiation, they can sue them. But NDAs are, you know, you sign them, but do they really have any value? Not really. So it's very hard to pursue. Usually you can't really relate what you get if you violate the NDA to what you might have gained by, you know, violating it. So the idea of negotiation or verifying some claims that you make in zero knowledge, rather than having to trust an NDA, I think is huge. Uh, or other things in a court case, we wrote a paper about this. Apparently, you know, when you, um, the FBI, say, is uh, tracking um, illegal activity on the internet maybe pornography rings and so forth. And they have evidence, which they got by, by writing some software that uh, was monitoring communication. And they go to court and they want to pers you know, uh, prosecute someone. It has happened time and again that the defense asks to see the software, you know, the spying software of the FBI. And sometimes the FBI does a calculation. He says, I don't want to release my software because then I won't be able to catch anybody else. So they drop the case. Uh, now that's not a good thing, you know, in this particular case, the FBI's are the good guys and the pornographers should be, you know, should, should not go scot-free. So would it be possible to use the zero knowledge for this, where in some sense you can commit to the software and you can prove all the properties that the defense wants to know about the FBI software without revealing it? So um, you're saying from the, uh, yeah, um, so maybe later we'll, we'll post some links to some of your recent work on, on law and uh, ZKPs that, that I personally know of and am very enthusiastic about. Um, so you're saying, and, and I, completely, um, I, I completely relate to that. I think that, you know, okay, good researchers have to be very optimistic and have to really, really love also their uh, results. It's like goes together. So like I can totally see how you immediately saw that this is going to be a, a, a big thing. Um, so did anything surprise you about the trajectory that the research of uh, IPs and ZKPs uh, um, led to? Yeah, this, yeah, sorry, go ahead. There's a few few things. First of all, and this is really, uh, you know, saying to you, like I put, my, I take my hat off if I had it to you, that you took something that was very mathematical, very technical, uh, in the world of these probabilistic checkable proofs, which have nothing to do with zero knowledge, and you sort of believe that you can reduce this very theory complex stuff to something that's practical. And that surprised me that you actually succeeded in doing so. That by using more math, you made it more practical and more concrete. Um, that's a surprise. And another surprise was some, a paper by uh, Boz Bach and a bunch of people in Princeton. So apparently some people in, from the physics department in Princeton were sitting and talking about how, so this is quite a while ago, how nuclear disarmament is problematic. Because even if the Americans and the Russians have agreed to disarm a certain, let's say, 100 nuclear warheads, how do you really check that they're doing it? I mean, the Russians don't want to show the Americans their technology, and the Americans don't want to show the Russians their technology. So how do you know that what they're disarming is a nuclear? Head. And then somebody overheard them and said, maybe you should talk to Boaz Barak, who's a student of Odette Goldrach, who's another colleague of mine who's done a lot of work together on zero knowledge. Um, he just won the Israel Prize. Um, and 
uh, they said you should talk to the boss because, uh, about this. Maybe you can have a zero knowledge proof that a nuclear warhead is indeed a nuclear warhead without looking at inside and checking their technology. Now, we use the term zero knowledge here, and in fact, the protocol that they actually came up with eventually of how to verify that something is a nuclear warhead does have a lot of ideas from the original zero knowledge, but there's a physical zero knowledge. Here. So in a sense, you need to do things, not just to send messages, but to, I don't know, shine light beams or something at a nuclear warhead. That surprised me. Uh, I mean, who knew? Oops, sorry, wait just one second. That's not what I wanted to do. Sorry, I wanted to, yeah. Um, what about uh, like the complexity results, like that, you know, uh, IP equals uh, P space and that like, uh, well, okay, I'll phrase it. Right. That like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, reach so, of, yeah problems right. you can solve. So that was part, that was some stuff that I was very, very interested in. Uh, I think mostly because I was trying to uh, show that things without assumptions. But in any case, um, there was this paper that IP, that is everything that you can convince someone with an interactive proof is actually a lot more than you could convince people with a written down proof. Uh, and a lot more, in fact, you can show that it's, you, I can convince someone quickly that something is true as long as that problem can be solved by an algorithm that only needs a small amount, let's say, a polynomial amount of space. And that's a, a, a very big set of problems, much more than uh, we can do with a written down proof. So this characterization of the classical complexity classes, like polynomial time, non-deterministic polynomial time, polynomial space, and so forth, in terms of interactive proofs, uh, is a completely out of left field. Very surprising. And then maybe the most surprising thing was, um, and I was involved in that paper, it's a paper with Muri Safra and, and um, uh, Uwe Fege and Lassi uh, Lovas uh, that was done when I was a, uh, on a sabbatical at Berkeley, and at Berkeley in Princeton. And uh, Muli was a postdoc and Uwe was a, a visitor. Uh, and that was to show that NP complete problems on graphs, on a lot of other things, but we talked about graphs weren't just hard to solve exactly, but they actually were even hard to approximate the solution. And in order to do that, we needed to sort of think about the, the class of NP problems in a very different way than it's been thought before. We had to think about it in the context of these interactive proofs. Uh, how that connection is made is beyond the scope of this talk. Yeah, I always say, you know, so I also have to thank you and, and your co-authors of that paper. Also for the following thing, um, from this uh, uh, amazing PCP theorem, there are like two paths that you could go down in research. And one is uh, the one that, that you spearheaded with this uh, famous FGLSS approach about hardness of approximation. And that is the path that most of research has gone. And there's this other path that that is, uh, you know, using it for, for you know, succinct proofs of, uh, of computational integrity. And very luckily for me, it was the path less traveled by, so that even right. though I came, you know, probably two decades later, or you know, one and a half decades later, and uh, you know, as a young postdoc uh, asked uh, Madhu Sudan for some question, he said, "Oh, let's work on." Well, he didn't phrase it in those words, but let's try to make some aspect there more efficient. So very lucky for me that most of the work was done on this other path, so that uh, you know. The, the theory that eventually led to Starks was something that fewer people had, people had looked at. Uh, so that's very, you know, I have, I'm grateful for uh, for leaving that, uh, you know, path uh, um, not as much explored. Um, I want to ask you, so like, do you have, you know, um, ZKPs and, and succinct proofs got this uh, amazing boost from blockchain. And I'm, I'm, I think a lot of the probably attending people attending this session come from, you know, heard about ZKPs because they uh, love and do blockchains. Do you like, do you see the uh, like, could it, would it have been, would it have been the same without blockchains? Because there was also this, uh, you know, right fruition of ideas with, uh, you know, Snarks and Starks and many other protocols. Um, would it have happened anyways, or how do blockchains yeah. come into this? I mean, maybe something else would have happened, but certainly not the way it's happened. It's uh, it's amazing. 
it's amazing how the blockchains and this idea of you know proof of work, which now people are abandoning, they're going in Ethereum, right? It's now talking about proof of stake, which I think Silvio and Algran sort of pioneered. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in any case, um, no. A, the blockchains and especially your work on in in uh, Z, uh, Zcash, Z, Zcash and um, I think money. You know your cryptocurrencies, yeah. I mean, we're not going to ask you for investment advice, on you know, but uh, yes, yeah, no, Zcash. Maybe, yes. You should definitely not ask me for <laughs> you did Not patent your knowledge. You did not patent any of that stuff. But um, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the blockchains have brought the zero knowledge and that whole crypto. The whole cryptography world into a, you know, I talk to my nephews and they ask me things about, you know, like ZK proofs and they know things about blockchains that I don't know myself. Uh, and cryptography. Do they now have more respect for you? Like you're doing something that they actually, with NFTs, yeah. and now you. Uh... Definitely, they have more respect. For me. <laughs> <laughs> I say definitely, they have respect for me now. <laughs> <laughs> the Turing Award, you know, that's not, but like, uh, you know, NFTs and uh, Zcash. Okay. If the Turing Award was a Nobel Prize, they probably would have, you know. <laughs> um, okay. Um, we're nearing, uh, we're, we're, we're going to be r- wrapping up soon. Let's take a few questions that, that are written here. So, uh, um, rejected five times, I mean, the papers. What were reviewers saying? What was different by the time that the paper got accepted? JC is that. I don't remember. You know, it's actually a very interesting question because I think we were so we were so indignant about the fact that it got rejected that we didn't really read the reviews that carefully. I mean, we read them in order to improve. But you know, compared to what I do now, every paper laboring over rebuttals and trying to convince. So we did that, right? Like they'd said X and then we would show no, it's not true, and we explain, but I don't remember. I didn't. We really. I must say that we viewed the reviewers as these lowly live. <laughs> I relate to that. Look, I completely. You know, I tell my younger co-authors. Yeah, there's one bit you care about because sometimes the paper get accepted and it's like blasted and changes, changes that. And I said to them, guys, it doesn't doesn't. You know, we got the one bit. I'm not going to use. You know. Uh, you know. I think somebody told me that uh, Moni Noel from Weizmann has this joke that he says that if you look at if you have one rejection that says the paper is not interesting, and one reject that the paper you told me the story that the paper is uh, is not important, not interesting, not new, and then the la- and when they say it's not correct, you know you're onto something. <laughs> yeah, so I wonder if you got that for the ZK paper, or you don't remember by now what what they said. I think they thought that we were just like, you know, what is this thing, this model, and this your knowledge, and who cares? Um, I don't think they got it. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. I'm sure everyone here who's an academic path can also relate to that sometimes. Um, okay, so next question. Well, I, okay, I want to hear your answer, but I can guess what you're going to say. How long before zero knowledge proofs become the standard for layer two protocols? Also, once zero knowledge proofs become a standard. Will optimistic and plasma still be relevant then? Um, yeah. So I, I think I need you to answer that because <laughs> I don't even understand how the terms you just used. <laughs> I was expecting that. Uh, uh, so let's. I, I mean, it, it's a very good question. I'm not sure that uh, Professor Goldwasser is uh, is is the right person to ask. Uh, I guess you know my opinion. I think you know Starknet's going to be it. Blah 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 blah. And, you know, but uh, let's leave it to some other talk. Uh, but it's a very good question, right? Um, okay. Uh, this one is about knowledge of the future. What lies in the near future for zero knowledge proofs and its applications? I mean, I mean I'm reading it funnily, but actually, it's, I think it's a very, it's a very serious and good question. So, so I, I think that um, I think zero knowledge proofs don't uh, exist in isolation in terms of their application. I think um, the idea of computing on encrypted data and proving that your computations are correct uh, and using it for applications like law and machine learning, that's there's a lot to do in the near future. So, uh, you know, the tools like homomorphic encryption, you know, where you can actually encrypt data and compute on it while it's encrypted. You actually do this in my own company, in Duality, um, and proving that you've done it properly. So there is proofs and there's your knowledge, but it's not on, on 
in isolation. But that's the way I see it. And in machine learning, again, being able to use all the data out there, especially in things like medicine or health or uh, or research about uh, health, uh, brain science, being able to get advantage, take advantage of data without compromising people's privacy, is, it would need computing on private data and would need verifying. I mean, you don't want you want to verify what people are saying. You want to verify that the data and the research is done properly, and you want to do that without releasing you know, private information. And that's right up the alley for zero knowledge groups. Okay, I, I will attempt to give uh, um, also an answer which says that, or, or rather to say, like um, at Starkware, um, the approach we're taking is, uh, and we're asked this a lot, is we say, we don't know what is the future of this. So maybe the best thing we can do is offer general computation accessible uh, to everyone. And, and we're sure the world with its creativity and amazing developers will probably, you know, they will show us what is the, whatever the killer application and so on. And that is really the short story of things like StarkNet and Cairo, basically having, you know, it's the same, I guess, answer that, you know, what is the best usage of uh, blockchain? Well, Ethereum and Vitalik are coming and saying, you know, we don't know, let the world uh, do with it what it wants. We'll just give it tooling. Um, another question, um, Miguel is asking, what's your intuition for post-quantum cryptography? Lattices, hashes, or something else? It says, sorry, Ellie. I don't know why you're asking me for, uh, I, I, you know, Starks are actually going to be very happy if uh, tomorrow there's a very powerful, um, uh, you know, quantum computer. But anyways, yeah, what's your intuition for, like, what's going to be based well, on? Right now, so, right, so I've done a lot of work on lattice-based cryptography. It was one of my side. I mean, that's something that has developed over the years. Actually, I have a book with Daniela Michiancho on it, on it, you know, but... And lattice algorithms, but uh, who is another student of mine who's in UCSD. But um, I think that all the proposals for post quantum cryptography have been broken, except the ones based on lattices right now. So uh, there were proposals for the NIST, National Institute of Standards, for a new uh, standard for uh, digital signatures, public and crypto, and that's all based on lattice problems. Uh, so, intuition or not, so far that's the only candidate standing. Okay. Um, uh, here's a question I like. Uh, okay. What do you think about zero knowledge intuitive examples like the Alibaba K1? Are they good for explaining such concept or the Where is Waldo or this? Like, what's your favorite? Uh, I never understood the Alibaba K1, I got to tell you. But uh, the Where is Waldo is a good one. I like the color. The, the, the Where is Waldo is a great one, actually. So, you, you know, this, there's a book, there's a lot of pictures, and you're looking for Waldo. And uh, somehow if somebody can cover in, in white paper and substance with the whole and show you that they know where Waldo is, uh, something along those lines. I like the colorblind example, you know, where I, you're colorblind, say, and I want to prove to you that something has color. So I claim that on a piece of paper that I give to you, there's red and, black, and green, say. And uh, you have no idea because you just see the whole thing in one color. So what you do without me seeing is that you flip a coin. And depending on the flip, coin flip, you either give me the page back the same way it was or you flip it over. And now I guess the value of your coin. So obviously if you flipped it over, but it was all green or all red, I can't tell. But I will be wrong, probability 50-50. But if you did flip it over or not, depending on the value of your coin, and I managed to guess your coin, then there must have been some... Okay, two more questions, and then I'll ask my final question. So one is, how probable are fully homomorphic computers? General usability time scale? Malik how probable? Well, yeah, well, I mean, how, like, you know, how, I guess, efficient, or, you know, when are we going to see fully homomorphic right. computers? Well, first, first of all, we have uh, homomorphic encryption, which is fully homomorphic. So we can take any computation and transform it to computation on encrypted data. This exists. And, um, you know, I think the best well-known method is by Craig Gentry, Vinod Vaikutanathan from MIT, and Svika Pakursky from Weizmann, also Svika and Vinod are my students. But, uh, so it exists, and uh, not only that, but there are systems out there, both uh, in duality uh, and, uh, Pal and in, in, in Microsoft, Palisade, Seal, uh, and, they, and, they, and they run computations that, uh, you know, sort of like there's a whole system of statistics that you can run quickly. So in principle, you can do everything. In practice, you can, I think, do essentially what you want to do. Um, and it's improving all the time. 
And this is without hardware. Once you have also hardware to speed this up, you know, maybe trusted hardware, then it could be even faster. But I don't think you need the hardware. Okay. Um, penultimate question, because then, um, how soon do you think until there are practical quantum computers that will cause problems for cryptography that is not quantum safe? JC is asking. That's beyond my pay grade. I actually think that they're probably the what's more likely is that we'll have quantum computers which are weak, and that will be a plus for cryptography because they will be stronger than classical, so they will enable us to do things cryptographically which we don't know how to do now classically. And yet, the, the enemy is going to be weak, so weak that we won't have to worry about insecurity. So that's an interesting model, actually, where you have some quantum power on, that we can use, but we can also assume that the adversary is bounded by us not all quantum power, but some quantum power. So I guess the last question, um, um, just can you offer any career advice to people? And, and I'm, I'm sure you're asked often about career advice for, let's say, researchers in uh, cryptography or computer science or math. Uh, do you have any career advice for uh, like blockchain and ZKP developer aficionados, like people who are um you know working on the code uh, because i think we'll, we have more of those and uh yeah do you have any advice yeah i think i think you should uh pay attention to what's happening on the academic front uh, i think you should pay attention to what's happening uh in companies who are more technology oriented you know rather than just sort of are sort of in the right place at the right time and have good business people. So in the Starkware, in Algorand, um, pay attention in what's, you know, in, in Kedit. Uh, pay attention uh, what's new, what some new ideas are out there. And sort of think carefully about the model. So I think in Starkware, it's very clear, you know, there's a prover, there's a verifier. Is how much space the prover needs, how much time, how much time the verifier and space the verifier needs, what it, where the run is coming from, what is the trust. So think about those topics and how that could be improved. Okay, Shafiq is also asking, I would be glad to hear advice for the academics as well. And yeah, let's close with that. Like uh, career advice for academics? In the blockchain or in general? Um, you interpret it, I guess, in blockchain and in general. Uh, well, well, I mean, academic, academic career. So if you have an academic yeah, block, yeah, career that's, right. that's why career advice. I mean, I think it's such a great place to enter cryptography and computer science. I mean, there are so many problems out there connecting really machine learning law, uh, you know, with, with uh, issues that are cryptographic. So the career advice is before you just jump just like think a little bit about what's interesting, what's important. And then if, even if you think somebody else has already done it as an academic, you know, we have this thing, we send a paper, or we don't send it, we have an idea, then so we get scooped. Nobody gets scooped. I don't believe in it. Nobody does exactly the same thing. You read the paper that you think scooped you and you understand what they did wrong or what you could do more and you go for it. That's my advice. This idea of, oh my God, life is so hard. You know, my advice is to have grit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, easier said than done. But uh, um, okay, so on behalf of, uh, I guess, all of our listeners, um, including even those who were expecting but probably will not uh, get any airdrops from this particular thing, I hope you got some, you know, knowledge and wisdom dropped. So thank you so much, Professor Shafi Goldwasser, um, Turing Award winner for the co-invention of zero knowledge and interactive proofs first of all for what you you know gave to all of us uh, you know we're all building on um, your giant shoulders and uh it's you know very inspiring and a great honor to have you here with us so uh, thank care. you very much thank you for inviting me bye everyone bye